Good morning, happy Monday. Today we're going to wrap up our discussion of uncontrolled radical polymerization and then introduce a concept uh, of uh, controlled radical polymerization, which is similar to, uh, to similar in, in mechanism, at least from the standpoint of the growing polymer chain, because it's still radical mediated, but quite different kinetically and in terms of the molecular weight distributions that we, uh, that we can achieve and also the technological applications that are, uh, that are permitted. So this is a field that has really exploded in the last 20 years or so, and particularly the last um, five years. Uh, in terms of the, the number of, of scientific publications per year, patents, and everyday products in which we find these, uh, these materials. Before I get to the scientific part of today's uh, lecture, there is a NETS and HE uh, lunch event starting at 11.30 in the Simer Room, and I will be there. Um, if you want to talk about the course or any other thing related to nanoengineering, chemical engineering, uh, if you're in chemistry, you, maybe you can get in. Um, anyway, um, okay. So at the end of uh, at the end of last class, we talked about the uh, the kinetics of. Um, initiation, propagation, and termination, and in particular we talked about steady state uh, kinetics, how the rate of uh, radical formation is equal to the rate of radical destruction. And what this allows us to do is use the rate, uh, the rates that we get to calculate the, uh, the molecular weight, because if you know the, uh, if you know the uh, monomers, the rate at which the monomers are added per second, and you divide it by the, the number of chains formed per second, that gives, you, uh, that gives you the chain length. So let's define this quantity V bar. As the kinetic chain length. which is the average number of monomers reacting with the active center that is just the growing uh, chain end during its lifetime. So V bar you can think of as the monomers added per second. Divided by the number of chains formed per second. Now what is the number of monomers added per second but just V sub P? the propagation rate. And what is the number of chains formed per second but the rate of chain termination? So we derived expressions for V sub P and V sub T uh, last class. And if we just take the ratio of those, we should get the chain length as determined by the kinetics of the reaction. There is one slight caveat here. So for reactions that terminate primarily by combination, so when two radical chain ends combine and form, a, uh, and form one big molecule, on average, the molecular weight doubles because you have two chain ends that that, uh, that terminate together. So in that case, 
x sub n, the number average degree of polymerization, is actually equal to 2 times the kinetic chain length. But for disproportionation, which is when a radical at one active center abstracts a hydrogen atom from the second to last carbon atom of a nearby molecule, grabs it off, and then one of them becomes terminated with a methyl group and the other one becomes terminated with a double bond, then on average, the number average degree of polymerization, x sub n, is equal to the kinetic chain length. So that's pretty cool. Through x sub n by the Carruthers equation, we can also relate that to p, the, uh, the uh, percent or the fractional conversion of either A or B monomers. So we can actually get quite a lot of information to interrelate uh, the, kinetic, um, uh, the kinetic parameters from the, the, uh, the molecular weight distribution. So under steady state conditions, V bar equals V P over V sub T, or uh, uh, V P over V sub T, which is actually because we have steady state conditions, we have V P over V sub i because V sub i or V sub t equals V sub i. And by our uh, expressions for V sub p and V sub t from last time, last class, we can say that this is equal to the, uh, the kinetic rate constant of propagation k sub p times the uh, times the uh, times the concentration of monomers in the system times the concentration of uh, of of growing chain ends in the system divided by two times the kinetic rate constant of termination times m dot squared where m dot is the concentration of growing chain ends but using the expression for, uh, for uh, V sub P, we can solve for concentration of M dot dot being V sub P over K sub P times the concentration of M. And we can simplify to get k sub p squared times the concentration of monomers over 2 times the kinetic, or t sorry, t times the uh, kinetic rate constant of termination times, uh, times v sub p. Okay, we're done with kinetics. Let's think about the thermodynamic implications of, uh, of polymerization. So if we think about the free energy of a polymerization reaction, we have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, where the free energy of a chemical process is a combination of the enthalpy and the entropy in some way. So the, for favorability, the enthalpy should be negative or positive? Should be negative. What do we need for a negative delta H? So heat is given off when bonds form or when stronger bonds replace weaker bonds in a system. And delta S 
we need to be large because systems that have greater uh, scenarios in which the configurational entropy of a thermodynamic system increases are favorable. In the case of polymerization, there's a tug of war between delta H and the minus T delta S term. Because we know that, that in radical polymerization, we are substituting one of these double bonds on the vinyl monomer for a single, for, for um, one, of the double, or one of the double bonds, the pi bond is becoming, the electrons in the pi bond are becoming a single bond. If you're on your phone, please don't be on your phone. A sigma bond between the internuclear axes is a stronger bond than a pi bond, which is above and below the, the internuclear axis. So delta H for polymerization is negative. Delta H is favorable. So all polymerization should, should go by delta H. But the delta S term is, is different. It's actually quite unfavorable to confine monomers to a polymer chain. Because imagine some scenario, a high entropy scenario, in which the monomers can exist any place in this three-dimensional grid. But then the polymerization happens, and they're all locked in a chain. The chain can still move around, but in terms of the total number of, of microstates available to all the monomers, it's much better off as a collection of monomers freely floating in the system than a chain that's confined because all of the monomers must be in adjacent sites in this hypothetical three-dimensional lattice. Does that make sense? So let's just think about the thermodynamic uh, considerations. Delta G of polymerization equals delta H of polymerization minus T delta S of polymerization. Delta H is negative because going from a pi bond to a sigma bond is exothermic so in a chemical process exchanging a no bond for a bond gives off heat or exchanging a weak bond for a stronger bond gives off heat now of course a double bond is stronger than a single bond but we're talking only about the pi bond Delta S of polymerization, however, is negative because we are confining the monomers to the chain. So delta H might be, so negative delta H might have the value of between 30 and 150 kilojoules per mole. And negative delta S P might have the values of say 100 to 130 joules per mole per Kelvin. So just to short, sort of show you what's going on, imagine a two-dimensional lattice where we have these monomers swimming around. And then imagine the after state where we have the monomers that are polymerized. 
So a little point of nomenclature. This microstate is not a high entropy microstate. The conditions that give rise to it is a high or is 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 high entropy. A single state doesn't have we can't say that it's high entropy because this microstate is only one of a bajillion. And this is only one of a bajillion. But we can say that the condition that the that the uh, that the milieu of possible configurations in which this one exists is much greater than the one in which this one exists, which is why we say this is higher entropy than this one. Question? Regarding the transition from a pi bond to a sigma, I was under the impression that the whole bond is comprised of both a sigma and a pi bond. So is what you're saying really just that the dissolution of the pi bond uh, into leaving just the single bond is already there, that's what's exothermic, or is it actually changing? That's the, so the question is, isn't a double bond stronger than a, than a single bond? So if so, why is it breaking the double bond exothermic? We're not breaking the whole double bond. We're only breaking the pi bond. Which of the two, the sigma bond and the pi bond, the pi bond is weaker. And when we take those electrons and make a sigma bond, then that's exothermic. That's favorable. They're forming a new sigma bond. Yes, the, the, the electrons in the pi bond are forming a new sigma bond, which is favorable. Okay, as a result of these, uh, these values, the, uh, the upshot is that delta G of polymerization is less than zero at at normal temperatures. <coughs> okay, how do we actually do this in a chemical plant or in a lab or in a factory? So polymerization processes The first scenario is where we have a bulk process This is monomers only No solvent And some characteristics are that it is efficient, green, meaning environmentally friendly, not to have solvent. Uh, optically transparent. And homogeneous so that you can do spectroscopy, for example, on the, on the polymers as they are formed. Uh, but but they are susceptible to auto acceleration and explosion. So we have all of these exothermic reactions happening at a very fast, uh, fast rate. And if it gets too hot too fast, we have all these hydrocarbons around which are flammable or inflammable, from which the word flammable was derived. <laughs> They're inflammable, and the whole thing will, uh, will explode sometimes. So they are susceptible to auto acceleration. And explosion.
So auto acceleration, a few reason, a few um, aspects of the reaction lead to auto acceleration. One is the heat generated. So more heat is generated. There's more energy in the system to get the next bond to form. But also as the, as the molecular weight increases, the viscosity uh, uh, increases and the chain ends don't find each other as quickly. So the rate of termination decreases. So they just keep adding more and more monomers exothermically. In, uh, in the book by Cowie and Origi, which is on reserve in the library, I saw a sentence in there. Um, it was kind of out of place, but, it, but it, it, it brought me some cynical delight. It said, uh, if the reaction completes without an explosion, and it was in a section that had nothing to do with uh, auto acceleration or anything, I thought, what? Is that normally a concern? But Apparently it is. Okay, so the clearest way to uh, to decrease the uh, to to increase the thermal uh, the the um, uh, the thermal dissipation is to just do it in solution. So solution in a solvent. So the heat dissipation is better So advantage or that heat dissipation is, is better but susceptible to reaction with the solvent And it is ungreen. Now, in industrial chemical processes, the solvent is under ideal conditions recovered, but even recovering it takes a lot of energy and therefore money. And if you don't recover it, you have to pay to dispose of it. Another way of doing it is by suspension. So suspension of the monomer in an aqueous phase. This is taking like a salad dressing bottle and shaking it up and you get little beads of the oil in the water and vinegar phase. So this is so this is effectively bulk and the droplet size are 0 0.1 to 5 millimeters. Uh, the problem is the reaction uh, must be stable to water. which is often not the case. So the fourth and final uh, way in which these reactions um, are done is in an emulsion where you have some surfactant that is a little bit like a suspension, but an emulsion uses smaller particles. So they're usually nano, uh, nanoparticles. So these are much much smaller particles, say 50 nanometers to 5 uh, microns. And the idea here is we can use the size of these particles to control the molecular weight because the, the, each micelle that is formed So it uses uh, micelles cells 
using a surfactant to control the molecular weight. What's a micelle? Micelle is a structure that has a charged, it's made of, um, it's made of hydrophilic and hydrophobic, first of all, is the word un micelle unfamiliar to some people? So micelle uses a charged exterior group, say in this case negatively charged, or otherwise hydrophilic group. and a hydrophobic tail. So a good example of this would be like SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate or sodium lauryl sulfate, which is used the principal ingredient in soap, that or something similar. And what it does is it solubilizes the organic soluble stuff in the interior while the exterior bonds with the water because it's hydrophilic, it's charged or otherwise hydrophilic or polar. So you get these little particles, these micellar particles that are nano to micron scale. And the reaction takes place inside, whereas everything else around is water. Okay, I'm gonna summarize the last bit on free radical polymerization. So features of free radical polymerization. Is it a bug or is it a feature? The first characteristic is that high uh, molecular weight is formed immediately. And I'm putting an asterisk here. And the asterisk, asterisk refers to what I'm gonna say right now. That while high molecular weights are formed immediately, the average molecular weight at the beginning stages of the reaction is low because you have, you have either fully formed polymers or monomers. Because, the re because in free radical polymerization, as soon as a chain is initiated, it's off to the races and then it stops either by combination or disproportionation. And then over here, another polymer chain grows, another polymer chain. Meanwhile though, everything else in the, f in the flask is a monomer. So the average molecular weight is gonna be low until the very end of the reaction because you always have all of these monomers still that are unreacted. But it's possible to recover high molecular weight polymer chains from a reaction at any time as long as you wash out all the unreacted stuff or you, you drain them from, from the flask into the sink. No, not into the sink, into the waste container. However, integrated all over all chains, you have a steady uh, decrease in the monomer concentration throughout the reaction. key point that differentiates free radical polymerization or any radical polymerization from a step growth polymerization, which we, uh, which we uh, talked about last week, is that only the active center, so only the growing chain end is reactive, and it's only reactive toward other monomers until the final termination step. So only the 
active center. So the growing chain end is reactive toward other monomers. Number four is that long reaction times increase the yield of polymer, but they don't increase the molecular weight of the polymer that you get out. Because the molecular weight of the polymer that you get out is just a, a collection of polymers that just polymerized and stopped, polymerized and stopped, polymerized and stopped. They can be of a lot of different molecular weights, but the average molecular weight doesn't change um, as a, as a uh, function of time of the polymers, forgetting about the unreacted monomers in the system. So long reaction times increase the yield of polymer produced, but not the molecular weight once you, uh, once you recover the polymers. Now we didn't talk about the role of temperature, but I'm just going to tell you an empirical observation about it. That increasing the temperature um, increases the rate of reaction but it has the effect of decreasing the average molecular weight because it also increases the rate of termination by combination and disproportionation. So increasing the temperature increases the rate but decreases the molecular weight because it also increases the rate of termination. The chains terminate earlier at higher temperatures. Question. Yep. Uh, could you repeat the part about number four where the yield increases but not the yeah, so the question is, how is it that long reaction times increase the yield but not the molecular weight? So if the yield is just the amount of polymers formed, the mixture at any time is pretty much at any snapshot a mixture of fully formed po polymers and unreacted monomers. The under, unreacted monomers don't contribute to the yield. So if, as we increase the reaction time, we get more polymer chains and therefore an increased yield. But the molecular weight of the polymers that we do fish out of the system at any time is always the same, except at like the very, very beginning of the reaction in such a short, like a, within the first millisecond of the reaction. Is that okay? It's really important to keep in mind in our discussion of free radical polymerization what is actually in the pot. And I like to think of it as as this popcorn model forgetting the effect, the the um, the fact that popcorn growing tends to accelerate, just forget about that. Assume that it's at the beginning where they're just kind of popping a little bit randomly and there's no acceleration. Just pop, 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 pop. Fully formed polymer is the popped kernel and the unreacted monomers are kind of like the, 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 un, the unpopped kernels. OK, 
Okay. Alternatively, we can have a scenario in which all the polymer chains grow at the same time at roughly the same rate. And this could be like the, like the teacup mechanism where we have teacups out in the rain. I guess the rain is an important part of that analogy. So we put the teacups out in the rain and the rain fills them up and they all fill up at the same time. Same way that grass grows. So you watch the grass grows. That's my most favorite summertime activity is watching grass grow. But you just watch it grow and then after like a month, it's grown an inch. <laughs> and that's how I think of the alternative to free radical polymerization, which is controlled radical polymerization. So you don't have pop, 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 pop. You have pop everywhere. Now, what is the key to the controlled <laughs> radical polymerization? The key is that we deactivate the growing chain end as soon as it's formed and we put a capping group that comes off periodically but only for, only for a short time and allows monomers to come in and react with it to allow the chain end to grow. Now if, they, if we allow all the chains to start growing but we stop them all early in the reaction but, and then allow them to grow simultaneously, then we can control the molecular weight a lot better. And there are three principal ways of doing this in the literature and in industry. And for the rest of the class today and for uh, Wednesday, we'll talk about it before uh, reviewing for the exam. So, so this is a controlled radical polymerization. Controlled radical is like a contradiction in terms, uh, but in any case, the word unpaired electron got uh, named radical before they invented this, so controlled radical polymerization. And this is uh, also known as a living mechanism. Whereas in contrast to free radical polymerization, when each chain recombines or disproportionates, the chain is dead. If the chain is, con if the re however, if the reaction gets to the end and there, are, and there are no more monomers around, but if you add more monomers in, if the reaction continues to grow, then it's alive. And that's a living reaction. So what's the an advantage of that is that you can make multifunctional polymers where you can add in new monomers that are different from the previous monomers and make block copolymers, which are like A, 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 A. Then all the A's are exhausted and you add in some B's and then it's B, 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 B. Controlled radical polymerization is not some people would argue that it's not quite living because you can't ever really prevent combination and disproportionation, but you can bring them to a vanishingly small probability. There are other techniques like anionic polymerization that we'll talk about uh, following the exam that, uh, uh, that are living and don't involve uh, radicals and are never, uh, never dead until you kill them on purpose. Sometimes this is called CRP, controlled uh, radical polymerization. And uh, in other words, this is like putting the brakes on. So what does this look like in terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, kinetic uh, reaction terminology we have we go from a dormant state to an active state But in any given snapshot, we always have more of the dormant state than the active state. So 
So this is present in uh, excess, and this is present in a small amount. And we have two different rate constants, one for the forward, forward reaction, which is the activation rate constant, and we have the deactivation rate constant. And if we add some monomers to the system, the monomer won't react with this side because it's dormant. It will only react with this side. And we get some new polymer that has some amount of M's added to it. It's literally a handful, like one or two, but not a hundred, that can add to it in the time it takes for the X group to come off and then back on, some monomers can slip in. So now we have this activated state, which has the monomers um, that I've added to the polymer. But again, we have a new equilibrium with now PMX, which is the dormant state, but now the polymer is a little bit longer. This is a new, uh, a new dormant state. A way that this is often abbreviated, because we don't like writing all of these arrows, is So Ka over Kda where we just have this reaction arrow pointing back at itself with a, uh, sorry, with a monomer over it. So importantly, what, what about this capping group? So this, uh, this group, sometimes called a capping group, the capping group uh, can reversibly terminate a reaction. By reversibly ter terminating, I just mean a cap. We can cap the growing chain end as it's growing, uh, but, but not initiate new reactions. So what we basically need is a stable radical. We need a radical that is stable enough to where it only reacts with other radicals, but not reactive enough that it initiates new radical reactions. So there are three uh, general uh, processes There is stable, uh, st stable free radical uh, polymerization is the first one that I'll talk about. Stable or nitroxide mediated. Uh, radical polymerization. And the key to this reaction is that X dot is a nitroxide group, and usually it's this particular nitroxide. 
which is called tempo. You can think of, those of you who are, who are musically inclined, tempo reduces the tempo of the reaction. So this can cap a growing chain end by reacting with the, with the radical at the growing chain end, but it cannot initiate a new reaction. So what are some of the features of this is, uh, so how you, could usually, how you could do this is you could have tempo in the reaction vessel at the beginning of the reaction and you add your ABIN or your DBP initiator. And as soon as the reactions initiate, the tempo finds the growing chain ends and sucks onto them and terminates the reaction. But interestingly, so you can, uh, you can initiate this conventionally So conventionally with DBP or ABIN or you can use the preformed nitroxide on a monomer. So some chemical company might have made you say nitroxide modified, tempo modified styrene, for example. And in this case, you don't need an initiator. You just buy this in a small amount, however many polymer chains you want, you buy that number of molecules or more likely moles. <laughs> And what happens is that this bond undergoes homolytic cleavage when you heat it up. And then you have your free radical um, that can react with another monomer. And in this case, if you have other styrene monomers around, vinyl benzene monomers, then you get the polymer. But importantly, the nitroxide group, the tempo group, can come is mostly stuck to it, but can come off sometimes and let more monomers in. Yep. So it's kind of implied, but are we to believe that tempo is not self-reactive? It's not going to cap itself off? Right. The tempo does not react with itself. Um, and in fact, when you buy tempo, you can just you can get it in a jar, and it's, uh, and it's stable like that. So other things you can do are you can modify the nitroxide group with, because you always know what the end group is in the polymer. Sometimes you want something that will react with proteins or, or surfaces or something. And if you put that on the tempo group, then you automatically know what at least one end of the polymer chain uh, looks like. So this is, uh, this is conceptually the simplest way to do a controlled radical polymerization. Next class, we'll talk about uh, atom transfer radical polymerization and uh, ATRP and um, reversible addition fragmentation termination polymerization or RAFT. And then we'll be done before the exam. Thanks.